four, three, two, one. So we are live now. We can start our session. Over to you, sir. So, dear friends, we had World Hepatitis Day yesterday on twenty eighth July. We had some other programs here in Guwahati. So, Northeast Digestive and Liver Foundation has organized this webinar today on twenty ninth to commemorate the World Hepatitis Day. Today. we are going to discuss about the problems of the liver mainly hepatitis b hepatitis c as well as another problem which is coming up as a killer disease the fats and fatty liver we have got three stalwarts of hepatology of the country with us and let us have a very interactive discussion for next one hour let us see how we can utilize it so just the problem what we have got the confronting the challenges of hepatitis b and hepatitis c am i number 12 that is what the question today all over the world we don't know which one of us is having the virus either b or c or both because today one in every 12 persons in the world have got the virus and the problem hepatitis b every one of us we know that it is a leading cause of death 325 million infected with it but unfortunately almost 290 million unaware of the infection with a mortality of 1.4 million per year worldwide it is 100 times more infectious than the aids virus and 200 times the more chance of having hcc if somebody has got b or c this is the global distribution of the hepatitis b virus infection the picture shows everyone everywhere and any time we can suffer from hepatitis b similarly hepatitis c is also a global problem with the leading cause of chronic liver disease and almost 170 million people are suffering from hepatitis c again the same way everyone everywhere can actually have the virus and ultimate results the progress on what we have got from acute infection to chronic infection to cirrhosis liver failure or hcc and finally it is causing the mortality or rising mortality the five year disease progress on what we have got almost 20% people chronic hepatitis to cirrhosis 20 to 23% of the population of having cirrhosis due to b or c it leads to decompensation and almost 15% in 5 years from cirrhosis to hepatocellular carcinoma ultimately it ends up almost 25% of the patients who have got hepatitis b itself is dying prematurely in their time but there are some issues probably we can easily prevent for example this family of four came to me and all of them have got the hepatitis b infection probably somewhere we have got the responsibility to aware make aware the population what can be done another family who came to us and here 12 members of the whole family had hepatitis b virus infection two of them already died and raise at different stage of the disease they are suffering even two of their relatives are also having the virus probably we can do something for that that's why probably it is very important and relevant of the world hepatitis day every year from northeast digestive and liver foundation we are doing the awareness program in guwahati and other parts of the state with the run for the liver on 28 july 
with the celebrities we are encouraging people to know about the virus and always we are involving the leading social workers for this run for the liver this is the last year program we had with almost more than 3000 people coming together for the run for the liver this year due to covid we could not do much but still we tried our best from the radio of fm radio from the tv channels different local channels we tried to come and reach out to the population for the awareness program of run for the liver as well as world hepatitis day this year due to covid we could not run coming to the street but yesterday we did a virtual rally in guwahati and here is the picture coming up and that's how we try to come to the population for the awareness program of hepatitis B and hepatitis C and the problem of the liver. We also do the screening. You can show some of the presentation what we have got. Along with the Tata Trust, Northeast Digestive and Liver Foundation, we did the free screening of hepatitis B and C in Gohati in my clinic. And this is what in last one year, 3,317 people were screened, 73 with positive hepatitis B, 33 hepatitis C. Another very alarming finding what I have got last one year is rising number of patients with IV drug users with the presence of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Probably our society has something to do here. With this, we have got different issues in relation to hepatitis B and C, why to treat, when to treat, and how to treat. Let us have another question coming up from the population because they are panicked sometimes. Is there any treatment of hepatitis B or hepatitis C? And the answer is yes, 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 we have got it. So today for next one hour, we'll be having this discussion with these three stalwarts, Dr. P. N. Rao, the president-elect of Indian National Association of Study of the Liver. We have got Professor Onil Orora from Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. He is the past president of Indian National Association of Study of the Liver, and also we have got the Kosal Modern from Max Super Specialty Hospital from Delhi, who is the Secretary General of Indian National Association of Study of the Liver. Let us have the discussion further. With this, I end up with my welcome presentation. Now I would like to request uh, Dr. P. N. Ra Dr. Professor Onil Aurora. So he will be the first one to speak on another problem of the liver, on the fats of the liver. Let us have the discussion from Professor Oni Lorera. Uh, thank you, Professor Goswami. It is a pleasure always to be associated with Northeast Gastroenterology Forum. And I think all of us should be thankful to Dr. Goswami for having taken this initiative and increased the awareness of liver and gastroenterology issue throughout the Northeast part of the country. He has been a pioneer in this field and I have been associated with him for more than 25 years. It is always a pleasure to work in, with him. And with increasing age, he's only getting younger and younger. With so much of the enthusiasm, I think all of you are blessed to have a person like him. So very aptly, he has chosen three different topics, which are the major causes of the chronic liver disease, which lead to significant morbidity and mortality. So I think with the intelligent choice of the topic, starting with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and then going on to hepatitis B and C, if you're able to tackle these three illnesses, I think we may be able to get rid of the majority of the liver disease which are present in your locality. So I'll begin my presentation with a disease entity called fatty liver disease. 
but rather than giving you a boring lecture on fatty liver disease what i am going to tell you a different aspect of what is what fat is to the body so i have uh one uh, i will i have titled my talk fatty liver disease is fat in the body a friend or foe yeah i'll just uh... yes are you able to see my slides yeah, now yeah, yeah. it is very okay. clear yeah so the title of the presentation is fat in the liver is it a friend or foe i think this is a important subject to know because all over the world today 50% of the liver disease is related to fat in the liver so is having too much of the fat or too little of the fat is it a bad or a good thing let me just take you through the journey of fat in the body and the liver in specific first of all let us as clinician should understand what are fats and what does fat mean if you look at the colloquial language of the fat it is a word that has several meanings in biology it may simply be a molecule it may just be a atom it may be a simple tissue or it may be an organ called fatty liver so fat may have different meanings depending on what you look at it but if you look at the basic structure of the fat it is made up of the fatty acids and what are these fatty acids fatty acid is a straight hydrocarbon chain organic acid they are typically even in number it is because the way they are manufactured they are produced in the cytoplasm of the cell so these are even numbered organic acid made up of the carbon chains with side chains of the hydrogens so basically number of the carbons are attached with intermittent intermingling of the hydrogen ion that forms a that forms an organic acid called hydrocarbon acid called fatty acid so what is it made up of fatty acid is basically made up of a carbohydrate backbone called glycerol to which three fatty acids are attached <clears throat> so if you combine three different fatty acids onto glycerol then you produce a substance called triglyceride i am sure you must be seeing it daily in your reports of blood parameters especially the lipid profile when you have a report of triglycerides triglyceride is also called tag tag is basically a glycerol molecule attached to three different fatty acid chains so for all practical purposes tag or triacyl glycerol is the same thing as fat in the common language so why is it important to know this fat and lipids one of the important reason is that it is an important component of your food so whatever you eat contains substantial amount of the fat because the fat is made up of a carbohydrate backbone coupled with three fatty acids then you have a fat which gives you structural component to your cell membranes that means the body which has multiple cells is covered by this protective gear called cell membrane which is made up of a lipid which is attached to a phosphate rather than a carbohydrate chains and secondly and finally all the cholesterol and the hormones which are important component for the day to day functioning of the body are made up of cholesterol which comes from fat only almost daily you must be hearing oh do not take saturated fat take unsaturated fat saturated fat is bad unsaturated fat is bad but what is the saturation and unsaturation mean it means that if this is a hydrocarbon as i said if this is a hydrocarbon chain in which you have central carbon atom attached with multiple hydrogen bonds if all these carbon to carbon bonds are single bonds then you do not have a chance to put in more hydrogen that means this chain does not have any capacity to absorb more of hydrogen so it becomes a saturated fatty acid but look at this fatty acid in this fatty acid on in third position from the right hand side you have a double
carbon to carbon bond that means this carbon bond has a capacity to accommodate and have one more carbon atom one more hydrogen atom so it becomes a monounsaturated fatty acid in addition you may have a another fatty acid in which there are multiple double bonds between the carbon that means it can attach and accommodate two more hydrogen atoms so a saturated fat means you cannot have more incoming hydrogen in mono unsaturated fatty acid you have one single carbon to carbon bond whereas in polyunsaturated fatty acid you have multiple areas where you can have incoming hydrogen which can be attached so this is what is fat which we eat on day to day basis as i said in common language we call it tag or triacylglycerol again to reiterate in free fat, in saturated fatty acid are car all carbon to carbon bonds are single bonds so they cannot accommodate any hydrogen in un, in mono unsaturated fatty acid which is called mufa you have one single carbon to carbon uh, bond which can accommodate one incoming hydrogen and in unsaturated polyunsaturated fatty acid which is called pufa you have multiple areas of double carbon to carbon bond which can accommodate more hydrogen atoms so this is what it translates in clinical practice so if you have saturated fatty acid all carbon hydrogen chains are in the straight line they are densely packed and hence you have a solid so butter is a saturated fatty acid because it is solid in character it has a high melting point but if you have unsaturated fatty acids which could either be cis or trans variety then you may have bent chains and since the chains are bent they cannot be tightly packed so they become less dense and they have a low boiling point so these unsaturated fatty acids by default will be liquid this is the typical vegetable oils so if you are eating butter you are taking saturated fatty acid if you are taking vegetable oils that means you are taking a lot of unsaturated fatty acid so where do these fatty acids come from saturated fatty acids will typically come from the animal sources unsaturated fatty acids which are liquid in character at room temperature they usually come from the vegetable oils and then we in younger age do have a tendency to eat lot of trans fat that means chocolate ice cream candies processed food all of these have trans fat which is far more dangerous than even the saturated fatty acid what is the journey of fat in the body anything and everything which you eat either saturated fatty acid or unsaturated fatty acid gets digested in the small intestine and it is absorbed into the small intestine so unlike carbohydrates and proteins that is glucose and amino acid most of the fat which is bigger in size it gets into the lymphatic system so the glucose and amino acid get absorbed from the intestinal lumen into the blood whereas the fat has to be transported across the lymphatics into the blood circulation because of the sheer size since fat by definition is hydrophobic that means it repels water it has to covered with this new membrane which is called monolayer of the phospholipids so a fat which is covered by the monolayer of the phospholipid is called lipoprotein similarly if you have double layer of phospholipid which occurs in cell membrane an, an a inner phospholipid membrane and an outer phospholipid membrane then you have a cell membrane so when the when the lipids are transported in the blood they have to be covered by the lipoprotein and what is this lipoprotein made up of you have central fat or triglycerides or tag it has a covering of the phospholipid then you have a carrying protein called lipoprotein and it also with it carries cholesterol ester so that is how the fats move from the small intestine after you consume and into the circulation via the lymphatics so once the fat is digested into the body it is taken up into the lymphatic from there significant amount of the fat is taken up by by the fat and the muscles and the fatty tissue rest goes into the liver after that it is goes into the liver it is excreted into the bile as cholesterol and the bile acids almost daily you must be seeing these reports in the blood of a patient with lipid profile you will have a report of chylomicron chylomicron remnant vldl ldl hdl what does it mean these are the different type of lipoprotein they are then these are the vehicles of the life of the phospholipid which are carrying the different type of cholesterol and lipids away into the different parts of the body the larger the size of the 
molecule, the more fat you have, the smaller the type, uh, size of the molecule, more lipoprotein you have. So in chylomicron, the purpose is it transports the fat from the intestine into the body tissues. So whatever is left is called chylomicron remnant. VLDL is produced by the liver and it supplies the fat to the body. Whatever is left is the low density lipoprotein or LDL, which is supposed to be bad cholesterol. Bad cholesterol supplies the cholesterol to all the body tissues for maintaining their integrity and for production of steroids and hormones. And HDL is something which carries the cholesterol away from the tissues back into the liver. That means it causes decholesterolation of the tissues and hence it is called a good cholesterol. So the higher the size of the molecule, chylomicron, the lesser will be the amount of the lipoprotein. Smaller the size of the lipoprotein like HDL, more will be the component of the lipoprotein and less will be the component of the fat. So HDL is the best, whereas chylomicron has the maximum size of the molecule. But what is the purpose of having fat in the body? How do you use it and what purpose does it serve? It may be used as a source of energy. Let's see how it is to used as a source of energy. Now, let's see anything which you consume. As I said, if you take one molecule of fat, which in biochemistry means a molecule which has 55 carbon atoms, 104 hydrogen atoms, and 6 carbon and oxygen atoms. So all fat molecules are oxidized with the oxygen in the body and they produce CO2. So everything has to be metabolized and causes production of CO2. So imagine every time you're eating fat, you are contaminating air, the air and adding to the human pollution by generating a lot of CO2. And in addition, a lot of ATP is produced which is the basically the currency for the functioning of the body. So is fat important for energy source? The answer is big yes. Now let's see what are the results of the fat, protein and the uh, glucose in the body. Suppose you are not able to eat anything for one particular day and you on an average require about 2000 calories per day for maintaining your body. So if you are just dependent on glucose, which is to a tune of about 500 gram, it is as it is stored in the form of glycogen in the liver and muscle. If you need 2000 calories per day, one gram of the glucose gives you around four kilocalories. So you'll be able to survive only for one day. So if you just have glucose stored in the body, you'll be able to live without eating food for one day only. But God has also given us muscles which are made up of protein. On an average, one person has around six kg of the muscle mass. Each gram of muscle gives you four calories. So if you are dependent on your muscle, then you will produce, you will have enough of reserves for 12, 24,000 calories. If you need 2,000 calories to survive for one day, you will be able to survive for 12 days. But look at the fat. This is what is important. On an average adult, normal adult has 12 kg of fat. One gram of fat gives you 9 calories. So you have 1,10,000 calories to survive. So in the absence of eating anything, that means if you are fasting for 60 days, you can survive. And you can survive only because you had the reserves of the fat. So this is the most important function of the body to give you the source of energy. Second is it is stored in the adipose tissue. And it whenever you take a lot of calories, a lot of fat in the diet, it will be stored in the subcutaneous tissue. And finally, when they are full, it will go into the visceral tissues as well as in the bone marrow. In addition, there are a lot of other functions of the fat. It is important for maintaining your healthy skin and hair. It maintains the right body temperature. It is important for smooth functioning of the cells. It gives cushioning to the organs. It causes formation of number of structural proteins which are vital for maintaining the integrity and the structural component of the brain and retina. It is important for absorption of the fat and fat soluble vitamins. It boosts your immunity and acts as a shock absorber for your bones. But why is it that suddenly a fat which is so good to you, it gives you so much of energy, it gives you reserves for two months, and why are we bothered? Why is it that it becomes enemy sometimes? So let me switch gear and tell you why it becomes enemy. Almost daily, you must be seeing 40% uh, of the children in Delhi are obese. In the Western world, in London and in uh, Washington, every second child is obese. You have 40% of the people who have fatty liver disease. Why is it happening? A recent article, published in Times of India clearly shows that from 1956 to 2014, the human consumption has increased by 129%. 
that means humans are eating much more than what they need to do with less work so once you are eating more than what you are doing and once you have exhausted your stores of this tissue so there is a deposition of the fat in the ectopic tissues so this is what happens you have a behavioral problem you do not exercise you eat a lot you have excessive nutrients you are eating more than what you need so you become obese that leads to development of insulin resistance and since insulin resistance has occurred you cannot store your fat in the subcutaneous tissue so where is the does the fat go fat ultimately lands up in important tissues which are important for the functioning of the body classical example being the fatty liver let me show you how the process starts let's see first in a gentleman this is an experimental animal this is a, a rat which is given normal amount of the food now with incoming food when you take lot of glucose glucose leads to stimulation of in uh, pancreas to produce insulin insulin goes to the <clears throat> adipose tissue and releases a hormone called leptin leptin goes to the hypothalamus and tells the hypothalamus that my tummy is full and we should start stop eating look at this obese mouse this person this mouse keeps on eating lot of fat so there is a good amount of glucose in the body so large amount of insulin is produced insulin stimulates leptin in the blood leptin goes into the brain somehow brain fails to perceive this leptin as an important component of hormone so the brain does not realize that you have enough of glucose in the body and should stop eating so this component is missing so look at this normal guy if you take 3 4 chocolates or cubes of the sugar you will be full but look at this chubby guy he will never be full he'll keep eating because the satiety center and because the resistance of the leptin in the brain is missing so in you have a normal defense mechanism in the body so this is a normal gentleman this is the fat and if you take lot of proteins you have anti defense mechanism both in the fatty tissue as well as in the different type of macrophages which will prevent injury to the fatty tissue as well as its migration into the liver but look at this guy who has become obese so he will have a different profile first of all his total fat cell is occupied by this fat globule that leads to the ischemia of the fatty tissue that leads to stimulation and production of pro inflammatory cytokines which will change the type of macrophages which respond to this from m2 to m1 you have pro inflammatory cytokines which will release lot of components which will go and produce fatty liver leading to all the complications first and foremost is normally insulin causes stimulation of the migration of the glut4 receptor onto the surface of the adipocytes and the muscles that means whenever you have insulin this gateway will open up and glucose will move into the cells of the body but look at this condition in which you have because of different reasons insulin resistance because of the obesity so the insulin which has to act through tyrosine tyrosine phosphorylation that is missing it is in fact replaced by serine phosphorylation with serine 5 phosphorylation what happens is you are not able to move the glut4 receptor onto the surface and hence glucose does not enter the cells and you have a persistent hyperglycemia and persistent insulin resistance so what does this lead to so fat you have lot of fat in the liver that also produces pro inflammatory cytokines and tnf alpha which causes serine phosphorylation phosphorylation which increases the insulin resistance and the result of this insulin resistance is the development of the fatty liver and once you have fatty liver you have a unending chain of the events because in normal insulin if you have in the body that leads to stimulation of the glut4 so glucose moves into the cell and the cell fat do not break down but once you have insulin resistance glucose cannot move into the adipose tissue so glucose is less in the adipose tissue adipose tissue release lot of fat causing lipolysis which moves into the liver producing fatty liver so in a patient with overeating and insulin resistance there is a chain of event so you have obesity which causes insulin resistance insulin resistance lead to lot of fat movement into the liver fat in the liver itself causes increased production of fat within the liver that leads to more insulin resistance and it is a cascade of the event which is a continuous chain one thing perpetuates another 
so a normal fat in the liver which is protective suddenly becomes the fatty tissue becomes inflamed and develops inflammation causing a disease entity called non alcoholic steatohepatitis resulting in cryptogenic cirrhosis so once you have a nash you have unending chain of complications starting with insulin resistance hyperinsulinemia lot of inflammation in the adipose tissue so fatty liver per se will cause diabetes secondly if you have fatty liver you have altered lipid profile in the body you have lot of pro inflammatory cytokines that will lead to development of heart disease called cardiovascular disease once you have a fatty liver you have altered pro inflammatory cytokines and increased ros levels in the blood increase release of the pro inflammatory cytokines like tnf alpha and tgf beta which leads to development of the kidney disease in addition because of the development of the nash in the liver from simple fatty liver you are more prone to develop hepatocellular carcinoma and the moment you have insulin resistance that leads to a lot of angiogenesis and preferential signaling of different mitogenic and anti apoptotic pathways leading to development of cancer so mere presence of the fat in the liver predisposes to development of cancer in addition it has been shown that with insulin resistance you develop number of endocrinopathies starting with hypothyroidism pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome osteoporosis and, and uh, hypogonadism you will be surprised to know in india today 20% of the young women are suffering from polycystic ovarian syndrome which is again related to insulin resistance so once you have excessive fat it leads to plethora of problem non alcoholic fatty liver disease obesity diabetes hypertension heart disease kidney disease malignancies endocrinopathy think of any disease it can be starting from the fat so there are ladies and gentlemen there are two sides of the coin on one hand you have a fat which is your friend when it is maintaining your health and skin maintaining your body temperature helps in functioning of the body it is important for the cushioning of the important organs in the body like lung liver heart kidneys etc it gives integral stability to the retina and the brain helps in absorption of the fat soluble vitamin boosts your immunity and is a shock absorber for bone but when it is excessive when it spills over from subcutaneous tissue into the vital organs from the uh, like liver you have unending chain of liver diabetes of complication related to fatty liver like diabetes hypertension heart disease dyslipidemia cerebrovascular accident so to conclude ladies and gentlemen fat is an energy rich nutrient which is digested and absorbed by a tightly regulated process though invaluable in maintaining health dietary excess may lead to plethora of problems with potential to affect almost every organ in the body which i have shown you starting from heart kidney brain and blood pressure dyslipidemia endocrinopathies malignancies initiation of the fatty liver and insulin resistance are the crucial initial steps in decreasing the cascade and breaking the cascade and we need to address ourselves in timely fashion and treat it aggressively to prevent the incoming complication to so sum up this will is my last slide the relationship between the fat and the human being is just like me to event it is a necessary evil i think my incoming president secretary of, of insl will tell us how to handle this necessary evil with that i'll stop sharing my slide and hand it over back to dr goswami uh, thank you professor onil rora for your excellent presentation we will be taking up all the questions there are a lot of questions coming up at the end of uh, all the deliberations now i would like to request uh, dr p n rao to talk on the accidentally detected hepatitis b so dr rao is the director of hepatology in aig hyderabad he is also the president elect insl india dr rao please Dr. Rao, you are muted. Dr. Rao, yeah. Now, now it's okay, right? Now it's okay. Yeah. Okay, you slide. Right. Share All the right. slide. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhavdev. It's always a pleasure to be associated with Dr. Goswami's uh, activities. 
and uh, we have been participating regularly every year and this time on the webinar otherwise we would have seen you in person we would have met each one of you well then the uh, Oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, oh, I think yeah. there is a delay. Yes, Dr. Bhavadev has already told you about the importance of the World Hepatitis Day. The theme, what is said, one in 12, that was the theme in, I think, it was 2009 or 2011, but it is still works out. Unfortunately, it's still the same thing. Although there have been many, many advances have been made in uh, most of the aspects by the WHO and the independent countries. And he also told you about the missing 290 million out of the total, you know. So that this is the now today's World Hepatitis Day, that is yesterday's, and the, the slogan is that, find the missing millions. That is the slogan the, this time very aptly. Well, as you can see here that this was way back in 2006 and I have taken this made the slide here. At this point of the time, the India and then represented here by 2.4 to 4.7 and this already, already we, always, we always talk about the intermediate range. But then have you progressed from further like that? This you can see that this is a Polaris Observatory Collaboration Study 2011 and uh, you can see that it is 2.5 and consistently varies between, although there are the differences are there, regional differences are there, that we are also coming close to coming to the low area also. The uh, recent uh, information from the Polaris Observatory Collaborative Study. Although we started the vaccine in 2002 in part, but in 2011 onwards, and then this being extended to whole of the country. And therefore, you are going to see the results of this 10 years down the lane now. After 10, just like Taiwan and others have seen slightly later, and that's what, that's what is going to happen now, right? And, but what is the problem? The pro 2.5 is very low for that matter, but the problem is that our population, and you can see that this China and India, the highly populated, Populated areas, number wise, it is a very high figure. And look at the population aged less than five years. We are still way long, although China has come down to very low now as far as the five years is concerned. Right? So, what does the terms mean? You know, actually, it should be incidentally detected hepatitis B infection or popularized by the IGB Pan, Dr. Professor Sarin's. Uh, place that is in EDHAS that is incidentally detected asymptomatic HBS subjects or inactive carrier. Of course they, they have a different connotations. You know, as you can see here, this call this says that is HBV infection. This says that HBS is positive and inactive carrier will come to a little bit later, right? They are not totally interchangeable words. Well, then what do we mean when incidentally somebody is detected hepatitis B, it can mean anything. He can have a normal liver, he can be in a chronic hepatitis B, the chronic hepatitis B without any progression, or he can go into cirrhosis of liver, or more sinisterically, they can come for the first time with the hepatocellular carcinoma. It is not unusual. It is not at all unusual. For the first time, they come with hepatocellular carcinoma, and people, then you'll find that hepatitis B is positive in them, right? Well, then, when uh, this is a little bit uh, 2008 from GP Pant, Professor Sarin's labs, at that time, suppose if you have a normal ALT and an elevated HBB DNA, normally we go by ALT to say that, you know, okay, liver is involved, liver is injured and liver has got an injury but then this has shown that in e negative patients almost one fourth of them although their dna although they had a very persistently normal alt at that time it was taken as a 40 and hpv dna lower than the five lakh copies also did have some amount of uh, hepatic injury that means that you cannot take it very lightly and uh, uh, then in the same one, it was also seen that flares, 
that means that only once doing is not enough how frequently you have to do alt in this people and it's been found out that it is known that and the spontaneous flares are very common and also the ones which are being correlated are 30 years of age remember this 30 years will come back a little bit later and also if you test for every 3 months 90% of the flares would be identified right and this is from greece again greece is the country where hepatitis e negative just like ours you can see here that the alt values how they fluctuate suppose if you do at this level then you will say that alt is normal and when you do at this alt will be very is high and sometimes very high then some of these are asymptomatic and therefore doing once in a year is not sufficient you have to do it 3 or 6 months and whether it's a 3 or whether it's 6 will come a little bit later and this is from the reveal study that is the hepatocellular carcinoma prospective study when these people followed for 13 years and you can see here that the, at the baseline the alt was normal but it depends upon what is the level of a, a, a dna at a base, baseline uh, if the baseline the dna is very high even if alt is normal and then there is a proneness for hepatocellular carcinoma and that is the reason why the people will be totally asymptomatic they do not know that they have any any hepatitis b and for the first time they can come with an advanced cirrhosis or even hepatocellular carcinoma it is not unusual even in our country well then i'll take you now to the latest uh, thing which dr gaurdas choudhary this is a field study and the screened medical camps over the seven years and 30000 people have been screened and you see here 2.3 i th i think this is also correlates with the previous figure in 2011 what i have shown you the 2.3 hpsc is positive people and also as you can see here that government facilities it is more whereas private hospitals it is less 0.4 so that means it all depends upon where you have selected the population uh, from and e positive or 30 percent and then e negative or 70 percent and people nearly 67 percent of them had a high viral load so this is asymptomatic who are coming for the camps so you can see the severity of the situation in our country even in this is a 2019 uh, article this is one of the largest published data in hepatitis b and more so see is 92 percent of them they felt very bad the moment they heard the story that they have they have been detected with hepatitis b and depression start just like what is happening now the moment somebody said covid positive first thing is the depression irrespective of their social levels and 72 percent of them they said that no no it's not possible for us to come for follow-ups on this one and 38 percent required the treatment and 67 percent required the follow-up and look at this one raised alt was found and high viral load and high alt was found in 74 percent of the hb is e positive and 61 that means the message which i have told you whether it is a previously uh, gb panth hospital study or whether it is a field study it means that the disease is missing we are missing the disease right that is the thing that is we have to, as he said run for the liver run for hbsag he said run for the liver i say run for the hbsag and kaushal is going to say run for the hepatitis c right now as he said somebody asked what are the symptoms and because there are no symptoms and by the time the symptoms develop into cirrhosis it is already late but still uh, hope is there and then why why hepatitis b is invincible why it is so powerful you know hepatitis c we are almost conquering and we are almost conquering hepatitis c but hepatitis b because immunologically we are not able to our t cells are not able to recognize the hepatitis b it is evading the immunological reaction and the more importantly the dna the, the ccc dna this is inside the cell of the hepatic cell and as it enters here it converts into closely covalent circular dna which is responsible for the production of the all the the, the, the genomic uh, um, varieties which are producing the components of the hepatitis b 
and this hepatitis this is the dna is the one which is self replenishing our drugs are not able to act on the ccc dna and currently we don't have any drug which can tackle ccc dna perhaps the next person who is going to give a nobel prize or some kind of recognition is the person who is going to say that yes i am going to cure the hepatitis b by eradicating the ccc dna and also integration in the one into the host dna is the one which is responsible for hepatitis c right and you can see here our drugs act at this level it makes an entry here gets converted into ccc dna which is responsible for production of the pg rna and the subgenomic all the components here and that produces the all the viral proteins and then assembly occurs here way back here this is the problem and somebody asked what are the advances in the hepatitis b this one i'll just tell here itself i won't go into the details and people are looking at how to prevent the entry of this people are looking how best we can eradicate ccc dna people are also looking at, at these levels also how how to silence the rna here and people are also looking at how best you know after having had all the proteins how best you can control them into putting into the capsule and then forming and then getting released so this is the this is the issue which is with us and this where entire research is going on for the new hepatitis b and then when you say hepatitis b is positive it can mean anything right this is immunotolerant now it is called a chronic infection this is immuno reactive e positive hepatitis now it is called a chronic hepatitis by the easel european association they have simplified the thing and the ones in the red are the ones which do not require treatment that is the immunotolerant and the inactive carrier the new names have been written here which we follow and also the difference between these two is that very high levels of hbv dna in the immunotolerant people and therefore you got a temptation we seeing at high level both the patient and also the doctor they will have a temptation to uh, doctor has got a temptation to give the drug and patient says my levels are very high and then and therefore and then he would say but alt is normal liver when you do the liver biopsy there is no liver injury here and the ones which require treatment are the ones which are in the blue here that is a chronic hepatitis e positive and then chronic hepatitis e negative conventionally the one with the immunotolerant very high dna e positive alt normal liver injury is less conventionally the treatment is not recommended for this group but and also in support of this we have two large robust studies from usa one is a pediatric trial and then an adult trial in these people who have a normal alt and then high levels and then they are e positive that means immunotolerant both in the pediatric group and also in the adult group and they found that a sequential therapy with powerful even with the peg interferon and uh, preceded by entecavir and then entecavir has been continued limited efficacy and therefore people do not recommend the treatment in the e for the immunotolerant stage and having said that that's the reason why i said 30 years you know the sometimes you know you have to relax some of the thing if the if the older than 30 years even if it is immunotolerant then one can see in which situations is that if there has been a family history of hepatocellular carcinoma or if the cirrhosis of course in respect to of a dna levels and then alt levels or extra hepatic manifestations in these situations you have to skip the regular recommendations and then you are permitted you perhaps you have to treat by the individual cases what does Does the the, the uh, ASLD say they said forty years, thirty or forty does not matter. It's a question of the semantics. Then you have to do the liver biopsy. We don't do a liver biopsy in each and every one here. We don't have a heart to do that. But one can do that. Non-invasive markers one can see and then decide to, to take the treatment. That's one which has come in handy nowadays. The fibro scans and other non-invasive markers using a very very simple um, parameters, right? That can. so again inactive carrier conventionally the treatment in these groups is not given that is e who is an inactive carrier who is e negative and viral levels are low less than 2000 internationally units and alt is normal 
and liver uh, if you see the uh, the fibrous scans and other things they also they do not have any fibrosis at this stage and these people required to follow up they require that is once in 6 to 12 months and then i say that i would go for 6 months rather than 12 months if the dna is low if the dna is high you can do it a little bit more frequently so then who are the people who are to be treated i said that this group is not to be treated and the these are the groups which require treatment but nowadays whether the e positive or e negative the difference is going uh, going out uh, really, in terms of a treatment, you don't have to look at the E positive or E negative, except in pregnancy and some of the select situations. So, how to manage these people? Those people who do not have cirrhosis. Someone asked, you know, what do we do if you have a cirrhosis of liver? Suppose if you want to treat, you want to relax, is that the easel guidelines come to you, that is the European Association for Study for the Liver Diseases, can see that whether it is E positive, whether it is E negative, if it is more than 2000 international units and ALT above the normal, right? Whereas the, uh, the Asia Pacific and the USA, they say that it has to be more than twice the normal. And then even the levels of the, uh, the ALT, ALT also different. See, in the, in the USA, in the Americans, you know, 30 and then 19, 35 and 25, whereas this is 40. Suppose I want to treat, then we can always say, yes, is the, this is the E positive, E negative, I don't bother. And then it's more than 2000 international units and is ALT is 35 or 40. Yes, you can, you can go ahead with the treatment because more and more seeing with a normal ALT having the disease, we are tempted to treat these people in a more scientific way. And you have got a scientific uh, recommendation here from one of the associations. So the easel they have simplified. Suppose if it's a e, a HBS says E positive, don't bother about E positive or E negative, E, e, e negative. That means that there is an infection. Uh, that, that means there are no signs of a chronic hepatitis here. That means ALT is normal. This is the one which is inactive carrier group, if it's a E negative, and immunotolerant group, if it's a E positive. Here you have to monitor these people, fibrosis assessment, and you consider the treatment in this group, whom we previously you said that you are not eligible for treatment. If there is a risk of LCC, risk of a reactivation, and uh, then you can. If it's a chronic hepatitis, that's a regular one. But then what drugs which we have now? We have here lemividin, as you can see here, that every year the resistance has gone up by about four years, because 70% of the people have developed resistance. We stopped using now. Adesovir also has got a resistant. Telbibidin also has got a resistant. And therefore, these are have got a low barrier, and therefore, we should not be using these drugs. So, what are the drugs which have been there? They've been there already for so many years. We know them: Entecavir, Tenofovir, and Tenofovir alpha alafenamide. This is the one which has been introduced recently and has got a slight edge over Tenofovir TDF in terms of a renal and then bone safety. And here you can see here that there is no resistance has been found even after about five years to six years of usage, whereas Entecavir, very small, 1.2, and then the resistance has been very low, right? And therefore, these are the drugs which are recommended. So what are the drugs which are recommended now? Oral drugs, Entecavir, Tenofovir, and then this is a TDF, and then Alafenamide. These have a high potency, high genetic barrier. Peg interferon we used to use previously, but in general, E negative, and ours is a hepatitis, the, the, the genotype B. And genotype B response is very poor. And then genotype A response is, is good, but genotype A is limited to Kerala and then some of the places. Largely, we got a genotype D, and therefore, peg interferon results are even if you say it, in, and also looking at the price and looking at the toxicity, people would not like to uh, go for a peg interferon. But there are some very special indications are there. The other three drugs we should not be using it because resistance is more and then low genetic barrier is there. And how long to use? You can see here that fifth year, keep on using it, the response rate goes up. This is both for the long-term TDF and the long-term Enticavir. So then, what do you choose? When do you choose Enticavir and then when do you choose the Tenofovir 
and basically if you are suspecting that there is likely to be a renal injury that means a diabetic with an nephropathy a cirrhosis of liver who is likely to go into hepatorenal syndrome and renal problems in these cases it is better to use an entecapil of course now tenofovir alfanamide is also there and you can use that also or if if you are using the tenofovir uh, tdf and you can switch over to tenofovir alfanamide lay uh, this one so that if somebody has been using it for a long time you can switch over and that has clearly been shown that both the creatinine clear renal issues and the, uh, the 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 bone marrow density of the spine have improved once they have switched over to the tenofovir alfanamide so is a long term required yes you can see here that if you stop the treatment right 70% of them will come back slowly they will come back so by and large we don't have a stoppage rule for the for e negative you should not stop at all for e positive of course nowadays the people are not much doing the e positive e negative but e positive if a three successive hbv dnas are negative then one can think of stopping not stopping think of stopping means you stop even if you stop it to give a drug holiday you have to keep keep them under the radar tell them that come to you free uh, for follow up and then see if there is a flare immediately you have to stop start but e negative but e positive also but in by and large our country e positive is much more e negative e, e negative is very common 80% as i told so we have to bother that you can think that it is a life with a long treat so long term treatment suppresses dna normalizes alt prevents fibrosis progression and even cirrhosis but remember if one somebody has started the the uh, entecavir or any of the antiviral drugs after the development of a cirrhosis of liver the viral levels will go down progression will also come down but they are under the radar for hepatocellular carcinoma even if a dna consistently is normal if the drug has been started after the development of cirrhosis of liver then one has to have a screening and surveillance for hepatitis so as i said when can hepatitis this treatment can be started cirrhosis indefinite someone is there is a question what is the treatment for cirrhosis cirrhosis don't look at dna don't look at alt if there is a cirrhosis you have to start the treatment and that is life long e positive consider the discontinuation when hbe antigen becomes e negative and develops anti hbe and then for this has to be consistent for 12 months and dna everything should be normal and then you can afford but still you they, you have to um, continue to look at them whereas e negative it is more or less an indefinite therapy well ladies and gentlemen summary is that The, the the oral treatment for this highly effective but it is not a curative one dna is suppressed but it is just like a diabetes and then hypertension as long as you treat it will suppress the moment you remove then it, the dna is going to come back and therefore long term therapy is required the drugs which i have already I told you that uh, and during the pregnancy of course uh, then the one drug which can be given throughout the pregnancy safely is tenofovir right entecavir should not be given tenofovir can be given telbuvidin used to be given but it's not available nor it is recommended tenofovir can safely be given if the person is already taking tenofovir gets pregnant you need not stop tenofovir and in the 6th month in the 32 weeks when you do dna if it is high um you can start tenofovir in these people and also advise the vaccination accordingly so the summary is that this is important i think i i want you to concentrate on this that is hepatitis b surface antigen positive that's what we are discussing about incidentally detected hepatitis b then it is a reactive a report is positive and if it is negative in immunotolerant people in the common general population if it's negative you can take that take it for granted and for call, calling it as a chronic hepatitis this has to persist for 6 months so this is compatible with the hbv infection this is the algorithm given by the who here then what next you have to do next you have to assess the stage of the liver disease 
by using the clinical criteria that is splenomegaly endoscopy viruses and ultrasound showing that there is a, a suggestion of a chronic liver disease that the portal vein is diameter is more and and also in the presence of a cirrhosis and using the apri score and then other simple parameters we can see whether there is a fibrosis or use a baseline fibro scan and uh, also decide whether there is already fibrosis is there if fibrosis is there straight away they require treatment you don't have to do any biopsy then dna you can do it in the initially every time dna is not necessary you can follow them with an alt if the patient has been taking consistently alt is normal except when he puts on weight alt will go up you know sometimes nafld fatty liver causes an alt increase then only you have to do dna again to say that whether it is a patient has not been taking or whether there is a flare and then next thing is this decides whether he has got a cirrhosis or not if there is a cirrhosis start treatment immediately and uh, and it is a lifelong treatment if there is no cirrhosis of liver then if, then as i told you that if it is more than 30 years then you can start the treatment if it depending upon the alt levels as i told you the indications you know when you have to start the treatment right and uh, then these are of course simple scores here as you can see here the parameters which are required age ast alt platelet count bma albumin and then fast score these are all what is required pip4 score is on the left side here and there are apps are there you just go and then pip4 and then nafld you can fill up and then you will get the idea what to do that one right and as far as now if ccc dna is eradicated we can say that there is a complete cure which is not, not possible now and therefore what we are doing is only a functional cure what is functional cure is it is only what is and that also is possible only in a small number what is a functional cure hbsag zero conversion that means loss of hbsag development of anti hbs dna normal alt normal that is what is called a functional cure even this functional cure is also rare only about 8% to 10% loss is there with the oral drugs are there what we are able to common practice what we are doing it is only a partial cure and therefore somebody asked what is the treatment and that is the reason why i told you about why hepatitis b is invincible why it is difficult to control is that single agent is not able to is only suppressing but it is not curing why it is not curing i already told you patient that is ccc dna is one of the most important factors so just like in hepatitis c or in hiv you need more drugs so the future lies in a combination of a oral drug and an immune activator for the body a ccc dna inhibitor and 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 these are the one this is only hypothetical situation that you know that a combination therapy is the one which is uh, going to the have a functional cure or an abdominal and combination therapy is only the one which is likely to be this is one of the things you know which you can have an app and then see to guide the treatment of a chronic hepatitis b and thank you very much for listening to me on the incidentally detected hepatitis b infection and uh, uh, run for the liver and run for the hepatitis b and thank you very much thank you all of you thank you uh, professor p n rao so now we have got uh, dr kushal modern uh, to talk on hepatitis c dr kushal please good evening sir good evening everyone and thanks for inviting me to this uh, uh, another session of your uh, uh, world hepatitis day celebration and uh, i have had the privilege of attending such meetings earlier also with you and uh, just give me a minute to yeah upload my slides sorry can you see my slides now yes 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 okay so uh, the title of the talk is hcb management in 2020 so uh, if you look at the global burden of hepatitis c it's more than 160 to 180 million people just talked about the previous speakers talked about uh, the missing millions the millions which you are not able to detect it is just the tip of the iceberg which you are able to detect and treat 
and what you are looking for is treating the millions which you are already missing so india uh, is a house to almost 12 to 18 million hcv infected people with a prevalence frequency of 0.8 to 1.5% if you look at the natural history of hepatitis c once a person gets it only about 15% are able to clear the virus 15% <laughs> Uh, will become chronic hepatitis of these about 5 to 25% over next 30 years will develop hcv cirrhosis of these about 3% per year will decompensate and 1 to 3% per year will develop hepatocellular carcinoma a story somewhat similar to chronic hepatitis b which you just heard from dr rao and once these patients do develop any decompensating event like a bleed or a ascites or encephalopathy look at their survival probability once they are compensated it's good the moment they develop a single episode of decompensation they have a very poor survival over long term but the good part is that hepatitis c virus unlike hepatitis b and hiv the genomes of hbv and hiv go inside the nucleus and possibly incorporate in the host dna and therefore are difficult to eradicate whereas hepatitis c virus genome stays in the cytoplasm and therefore easy to eradicate and lo and behold now we have effective drugs with which we can effectively cure hepatitis c infection so just a historical concept about the treatment of hepatitis c how it evolved it all the story all started with 1986 with plain interferon with very dismal response rates as you can see around less than 10% over the next two decades we were only left with treating these patients with a weekly injection of pegylated interferon and ribavirin for 6 to 12 months with best response rates reaching about 60% and you all know that these uh, treatments were painful they were expensive and almost 10 to 20% patients would drop out of Uh, the therapy even before completing the treatment and they had no option just than just to wait for themselves to develop cirrhosis and its complications and then came this the new adv uh, advances in molecular biology of hepatitis c where they looked at and studied the structure the function and the assimilation of the proteins of the viral hepat uh, the hepatitis c virus and three major proteins or three major uh, genes were found to be uh, targeted or uh, uh, genes which or uh, proteins which could be targeted the prominent ones were the ns3 ns4a protease the ns5b uh, rna dependent rna polymerase and ns5a or uh, non structural 5a protein uh, which were responsible for forming the replication process uh, uh, complex so the first to come were these protease inhibitors this although increased the response rate to almost 70% but the treatment was even more painful even more expensive and there were more dropouts till the time uh, oral antivirals came in and the first one to come in was sofosbuvir which was a ns5b inhibitor and it revolutionized the treatment of hepatitis c initially it was combined with pegylator interferon and used to get now a response rate was of almost 90% with only 3 month therapy and this was a considerable uh, milestone which had been achieved however there was more to come and then there was an all oral combination of ns5b and ns5a inhibitors and now you could achieve with all oral therapy a response rate upward of 95% in almost uh, most of the genotypes so now what we were able to achieve was an oral treatment which was painless single pill a day and you could achieve cure in almost 100% patients in within 8 to 12 weeks so uh, let's look at what are the available drugs and combinations to us so a combination of ns5b and ns5a inhibitors remember if you want to remember the name ns5b inhibitors are called buvirs ns5a inhibitor are called asvirs and ns34a protease inhibitors are called trevirs so uh, 
the combinations which are available are sofosbuvir plus ledipasvir it is a co formulated tablet sofosbuvir plus declatasvir one company is coming out with co formulated uh, tablet otherwise they are both available as separate molecules also and recently sofosbuvir plus velpartasvir which again is a co formulated uh, uh, drug the drugs which are also very effective but unfortunately are not available in our country are elbasvir grazoprevir combination pibrentasvir and glicoprevir combination and a combination of sofosbuvir velpartasvir and boxilaprevir now in order to reduce confusion because possibly these drugs will not be available in our country in near future i will not be talking about these drugs uh, uh, in the rest of my talk so i'll concentrate on these three molecules which are available for use in our country among these sofosbuvir plus ledipasvir is specific to genotype 1456 most effective against these whereas sofosbuvir plus declatasvir and velpartasvir are pan genotypic combinations second again i will since although there are six genotypes six prominent genotypes the most common genotypes in our country are genotype 3 predominantly in two thirds of patients and followed by genotype 1 in about one third of patients so i'll be talking only about genotype 1 and genotype 3 otherwise i'll spend more than 2 hours and leave you more confused so i'll talk uh, try to emphasize the points based on these cases so let's look at case number 1 a 33 year old gentleman who was asymptomatic presented to us with deranged lfts ast alt of 48 and 70 further investigation hbsag negative nt hcv was positive hcv rna uh, was subsequently done which was about 6.5 lakhs the genotype was 1 and a fibro scan value was uh, almost normal the liver stiffness measurement was 7 kilo pascals so more than 7.5 is called significant fibrosis and more than 12.5 is called cirrhosis range so this person had genotype 1 with no cirrhosis and activity in the liver these days we have stopped doing liver biopsies in patients of hepatitis c because it is not required based on these three information you can start these patients on treatment so this patient had genotype 1 and no cirrhosis let's look at the response rates to the available combinations so sofosbuvir ledipasvir 100% response rate after 12 week therapy sofosbuvir declatasvir 96.4% sofosbuvir velpartasvir 99% so almost no difference you can cho choose either of these three for a patient who is genotype 1 and has no cirrhosis suppose this person had a fibro scan value of 15 so this patient would be genotype 1 with cirrhosis now let's look at the response rate with these three drugs with sofosbuvir velpartasvir it's still 99% whether you have cirrhosis or no sofosbuvir declatasvir significantly lower as compared to if the patient was non cirrhotic and sofosbuvir ledipasvir almost a uh, minor difference as compared to if the patient did not have cirrhosis so this particular gentleman if he remains uh, non cirrhotic the treatment options are 12 weeks of either of these three drugs which are available in the country one tablet of sofosbuvir plus ledipasvir or sofosbuvir plus declatasvir or sofosbuvir plus velpartasvir daily for 12 weeks and if the same person had cirrhosis then the options are you just remove the option of declatasvir treat this patient with sofosbuvir velpartasvir or sofosbuvir ledipasvir for 12 weeks and you will get almost 98 to 99% response rate now coming to case number 2 a 45 year old lady presented with chronic fatigue found to have raised ast alt now if you will concentrate ast is more than alt this usually happens when these patients become cirrhotic or start developing advanced fibrosis and this is a typical history these patients will give you history of blood transfusion during childbirth 21 years of age so this virus has been with her for almost 24 years and i just told you that within a span of 20 to 30 years these patient will develop cirrhosis further investigation nt hcv was positive hcv rna load was 7 lakh genotype was 3 
and the fibro scan value was 23, suggestive of cirrhosis. So you can see patient did not have ascites. So this patient had genotype 3 with uh, cirrhosis. A female patient, genotype 3 with cirrhosis, a typical presentation we see these patients uh, regularly in our clinical practice. So genotype 3 with cirrhosis, what are the treatment options and what are the response rate? So fosbuvir plus velpartasvir, 93%, fantastic response rate. But look at this, so fosbuvir plus velpartasvir, only 58% with well-week regimen. So this doesn't appear to be a good option. This appears to be a good option. Why are we not talking about ledipasvir? Because ledipasvir is not pan-genotypic. It is specific for genotype 1. So suppose this person did not have cirrhosis. This lady, his, her LSM value was say 5 or 6. So she was genotype 3 and non-cirrhotic. Then it would not have made any difference whether you used velpartasvir based combination or declatasvir based combination. Response rates upwards of 95%. So how do you increase the response rate if you have to use still use DACLA because DACLA Declatasvir is a cheaper uh, combination. So either you add ribavirin if you want to give it for 12 weeks or you increase the duration to 24 weeks if you do not want to add ribavirin. So this particular study, 395 patients, 81% of them had cirrhosis. Ribavirin was given on physician discretion to 20% of patients. I know this is a busy slide, but just concentrate on these two, uh, this, these two parts of the uh, graph. The dark bars are of cirrhosis. This blue bars are non-cirrhosis. So adding ribavirin, 12 weeks, you get a good response rate in cirrhosis with declatasvir. Even if you don't add ribavirin, if you increase the duration to 24 weeks with soft declatasvir, again, you get close to 85 to 90% response rate in cirrhotics. So this case two of a 45 year old lady who's a compensated cirrhosis with genotype three. So options are 12 weeks of soft plus velpartasvir or 24 weeks of sofosvir plus declatasvir. And here you would be uh, losing the advantage of cost if you want to give it for 24 weeks. So it's better to give sofosvir plus velpartasvir. Or if you want to shorten the duration and still give declatasvir, then you have to add ribavirin for a 12 week course. Now, if this patient, like I told you, did not have cirrhosis and the LSM was only eight, then you could still give 12 weeks of soft velpa or soft declatasvir. Now, based on these, based on these findings and these results, uh, these were taken up, uh, they were uh, consensus meetings of uh, formulation of HCV treatment guidelines by the Indian National Association for Study of Liver, which were adopted by the national guidelines for diagnosis of diagnosis and management of viral hepatitis as part of National Viral Hepatitis Control Program. And they gave a very simplified algorithm. So person confirmed with HCV infection, just find out whether the patient has cirrhosis or not by doing non-invasive investigations. If you have fibro scan, or you can do simply by platelet count and AST, ALT values, you, uh, either the APRI score or FIB score, FIB4 score, they are not very difficult. You just go to your smartphone or your computer, enter on Google APRI calculator or FIB4 calculator, just enter the values and you'll have them. So if the patient does not have cirrhosis, then declatasvir is a good and a cheaper combination, 12 weeks of soft declatasvir. If the patient has cirrhosis compensated, then just switch to soft plus velpartasvir for 12 weeks. No need to do a genotype also because these are pan-genotypic drugs. Without cirrhosis, this will work well. With cirrhosis, this will work well. Not doing a genotype, you'll be saving the patient almost 8,000 rupees. So that was for patients who had either compensated cirrhosis or non-cirrhosis. Very simple treatment either soft velpa or soft dacla for 12 weeks. So coming to the next case, 56 year old male presented with abdominal distension for one month, ultrasound showed cirrhosis and ascites, high ALT, low albumin, HCV RNA positive. Again, giving history of blood transfusion 30 years ago during a surgery. 
So this is a decompensated cirrhosis with HCG. So what are the options for a decompensated cirrhosis? We have only three drugs available, soft ledipasvir, soft declatasvir, soft velpatasvir. How do we increase response rate in decompensated cirrhosis, which are supposed to be difficult to treat? Either you add reverberin to a 12-week course, or again, you increase the duration to 24 weeks. So let's look at this particular study again, which is velpatasvir based. Why Vel velpatasvir? Because we have to put our best foot forward. And among these three, velpatasvir, so phosphobir appears to be the best combination available. Uh, this is a study done in decompensated cirrhosis, 12 weeks of three drugs or 24 weeks of two drugs. Both genotype one, genotype three, best results with a combination of three drugs, 96% in genotype one, and 85% in genotype 3. Again, based on this, the national guidelines for viral hepatitis management, genotype independent protocol. If the patient is reverberin tolerant, then give three drugs for 12 weeks, reverberin intolerant, soft VELPA for 24 weeks. Very simple algorithms in the national guidelines. No need to get confused. Now, if I start talking about all these special situations, then possibly I'll take another half an hour and we don't have much time. So I'll just tell you uh, in brief that treatment of HCV in these special situations require uh, special care and should be handled by specialists. My suggestion to all of you would be to refer these patients who have hepatitis C with these special situations to a hepatologist. Decompensate cirrhosis I've already talked about. Patients who are post-liver transplantations Patients who have concomitant end-stage renal disease, these are particularly troublesome patients, and so I'll talk about this also. And especially uh, in our uh, hemodialysis units, almost 45% patients may have uh, HCV infection, so it's a very important issue which you physicians would be dealing with. Fourth is HIV-HCV co-infection. And a very important issue, although now very rare, is a relapse after a course of DAAs. I told you these are very, uh, very effective, very potent, directly acting antiviral combination, achieving response rates to upwards of 95%. So those 5% who relapse after treatment, what do you do in them? And finally, resource constraint settings and HCV in children. So we can discuss this, uh, these issues during question answer session. I'll just spend some more time in patients who have end stage renal disease. The problem with end stage renal disease is the major uh, inactive metabolite of phosphobir, that is GS331007, is excreted through kidneys and in CKD patients. Uh, the concentration of this molecule may go up to 450% of that of baseline and likely to cause toxicity. So this was the fear. And so based on that, they looked at what a lower dose of sofosbuvir would do. It definitely lowers the exposure to this metabolite, but what happens clinically? So based on this and based on the need, many physicians started treating these patients either with low dose sofosbuvir uh, along with a uh, NS5A inhibitor, dose of which does not need to be changed or even full dose. So based on that, there were meta-analysis of 21 studies of 717 HCV positive patients with CKD on dialysis, 58% of them. And it was found to be safe and effective with response rates more than 90%. So this is a study from India, 36 patients, all genotype, so phosphobir low dose plus declatasvir, 90% response rates. So based on that, FDA approved the use of sofosbuvir containing regimens in ESRD patient in November 2019. And ASLD recommends that no dose adjustment is required in ESRD patient receiving standard regimens. So this part has been taken care of. CKD patients you can treat like normal HCV patients. Finally, coming to drug interactions, which is very important, which you must all remember. And the only absolute contraindication is co-administration with amiodarone. There have been studies of sofosbuvir and ledipasvir causing fatal bradyarrhythmias and even cardiac arrest in patients who were on amiodarone. The reason we really do not know. And use of these drugs along with, uh, uh, since these drugs are PG, uh, PGP in, 
sub substrates. So use of these drugs along with PGP inducers or cytochrome P450 inducers can reduce the comp, uh, concentration of DACLA and Belpa and therefore should be avoided. For example, patient receiving the rifampicin, carbamazepine, or phenytoin. Another issue is many of these patients, since we are gastroenterologists, we are uh, prescribing, even the physicians are rampantly prescribing proton pump inhibitors. Co-administration of PPIs can reduce the absorption of velpatasphere. Therefore, this should be avoided. If you feel it is necessary, then sofosbuvi velpatasphere is to be taken with food and PPIs should be given four hours later. Remember, velpatasphere can increase the exposure to digoxin and tenofovir. Tenofovir was an issue earlier, especially in HIV patients because they would be uh, receiving tenofovir-based combinations also. But nowadays, the, uh, and there was a uh, concern about tenofovir high dose, uh, high concentration causing renal injury. But now with the availability of the newer version of tenofovir, that is tenofovir alafenamide, this fear also has been taken care of. There have been several interactions which have been described with antiretrovirals. It's impossible to remember all of them which direction they will take the drug concentration. So I would suggest that whenever there's an issue, you go to this website and look for the interactions and suggestions given there. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, India has a prevalence of HCV of about 0.8 to 1.5%, which is given the huge population which ha we have, it's a huge load of uh, HCV patients, and most of these patients remain undetected. They do not even know that they are harboring HCV infection. It causes significant morbidity and liver-related mortality. But if cure can be achieved, it can definitely prolong survival, even in advanced cases. Earlier, what we were doing was painful attempt at treatment, and now we have moved to a painless cure. Pan-genotypic regimens have further reduced their duration and therefore the cost of therapy. Now we have very simplified regimens available and which are very cheap. So if you have no cirrhosis, no need to do genotype. If you have no cirrhosis, just give soft plus DACLA for 12 weeks. If you have cirrhosis, give soft plus Velpata sweet for 12 weeks. So 12 weeks, single pill a day. If you have decompensated cirrhosis, then either add rebavirin and give for 12 weeks, two soft velpa. If you have rebavirin intolerant, then two soft velpa uh, increase the duration to 24 weeks. The only difference between uh, decompensation and non-decompensation is in decompensated, give only velpa to speed based combination. Special groups need to be referred and managed and have to be treated cautiously. For example, end-stage renal disease, treatment failures, HIV co-infection, post-liver transplant patient, and children with HCV. Also remember, most of the drug-drug interactions, specifically that with amiodarone, the PGP inducers, and with antiretroviral drug. Thank you for a patient hearing. Muted, muted. Vaudev, you are muted. Unmute, unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we are able to hear. So thank you, uh, Kosal. Sorry, uh, it was unmuted uh, now. Okay. So uh, we have got a lot of questions coming up. Probably from the beginning, we'll start. Uh, Dr. Bipul Kumar Das uh, from Assam uh, he has got two questions regarding. Uh, the advanced treatment of hepatitis. So both these questions, your questions are already answered probably during the discussion by Dr. P. N. Rao and uh, Dr. Kosal Modern. We have got newer uh, molecules coming up for hepatitis B and C. It is already answered. Then the third question is uh, Dr. T. A. Soudhury from Guwahati. He is asking, uh, does a new patient HCV positive require typing essay now. And probably Dr. Kosal, you like to answer this question? Uh, typing essay means genotyping? Yeah, I think uh, he's asking about, he's a nephrologist uh, basically. Yeah, so, so uh, if we go by these national guidelines and if the patient does not have cirrhosis, then possibly uh, we do not require genotyping. 
only in certain patients who have cirrhosis and you want to exclude the presence of genotype 3 that is the only group where you would want to do a genotyping now but if you look at the national guidelines they have removed that part of genotyping also so if you do not want to geno genotype your patient and reduce the cost you will be well within your right to do that Dr. Bhavadev, yeah. can I suggest something? Bhavadev, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, I just noted down the questions, important things, and I will just scan through. Yeah, I can yeah. Finish in about five minutes, just five minutes, I can finish off most of them. Yes, Rest yes. Of to fatty liver of the disease, or diet in the fatty liver, and the other things. Right? Yeah. yeah. I just, uh, just take yeah, five yeah, minutes. You, what do you do? Because yeah, you go, you, you yeah, become your side, you start it. Okay, your side. Yeah. You, you moderate this uh, question answer part because already you have identified because a lot of questions are here. Ah, no, no, that's right. That's why I scanned through the questions. How important yes, questions, you know, they say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one interesting question is that what are the extra hepatic sites of hepatitis B? You know, it has also been found in the peripheral blood monocytes, spleen, kidney, blood vessels, which is causing the vasculitis, right, and lymph nodes. Right, and then in hepatitis B in the liver, it gets integrated. That is the reason why, in spite of treatments, sometimes these people go on to hepatitis C. And dose of in cirrhosis of liver, what is the hepatitis B? Usually, 0.5 milligrams is sufficient. Only rarely, sometimes we give one milligram if they are not if they are not responding it. Don't look for DNA. Don't look for ALT. Treat the, every one of them. Then they said that elastography and then fibro scan, what is the difference? Elastography is a method of assessing the fibro fibrosis in the liver. Varieties are there. You can do it by the fibro scan where you can get a figure, but you don't see any liver tissue there. Then we've got an RFE where you can see the liver tissue and also you can assess what is the fibrosis. Then you've got an MRI where you can get an MRI elastography. So elastography means assessing the fibrosis by various means, right? And uh, in people with the renal disease, what to do? Enticavir has to be given 0.5 milligrams once a week on the, after the dialysis is done, it is to be given, right? For TDF and then TAF, less than 15 creatinine clearance, it should not be given, you should not, you should not give it. Um, for for ten of aver, depending upon the creatinines, you can give it an alternate day if it is uh, creatinine clearance is between thirty to forty, and uh, dialysis you should avoid giving it, and then enticavir is the best uh, uh, treatment for uh, this one. How to prevent hepatitis B? Vaccination, and uh, oh, that's all. I think these are the important questions you know which uh, I got through. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then uh, we have got uh, another question from Mehta who said Soikya. He was asking, how are the early signs of hepatitis? So if it is acute viral hepatitis, so uh, obviously the, the common problem like uh, initially mild fever, then there is nausea, vomiting. This there will be uh, the yellow is, uh, urine and the sclera. That is what usual uh, acute viral hepatitis, maybe A, maybe B, or C, or E, the same thing. But point is, most of the time we don't know because already our both the speakers are telling us that uh, most of the time it may be asymptomatic initially. So after that, if there is a chronic hepatitis or the patient is symptomatic with cirrhosis or bleeding, then only we have to know all these areas. Then the, another question, just want to know the drug regime for cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, I think uh, Anil, you can answer this one. So what is the question? Uh, question is, just want to know the drug regime for cirrhosis of the liver. Cirrhosis drug regime, it is very difficult, but in short, you can just sum up. Yeah, you know, cirrhosis of the liver is an end stage disease, which occurs because of the multitude of etiologies which include the ones discussed by Professor Rao and Professor Caution, that is hepatitis B and C, which needs to be treated accordingly. If you look at the five major reasons for liver disease in India, they will include alcohol, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So once you have a cirrhosis of the liver, then your aim should be to maintain it in a compensated state. That means you not do not let him have the ascites, jaundice, hepatic enthalpathy, or GI bleeding. First and foremost is you look at the initiating event. If a patient drinks alcohol, stop alcohol. If you are overweight, try to lose 
weight if you are hepatitis b and c positive so take the treatment accordingly in terms of antiviral b and c therapy that have been mentioned yeah we all patient with cirrhosis should also have vaccination and if they have decomposition then you have to deal accordingly depending on what component of the decomposition like a cystis gi bleed etc you have yeah another question from d n kakoti from guwahati what is the diet for fatty liver disease i think onil uh, yeah fatty liver disease occurs as i shown you because of imbalance between what you consume and what you spend in terms of your daily routine activity yeah I balance think, uh, especially if you have underlying gen tendencies to accumulate fat in the liver so a combination of restriction of the calories coupled with regular exercise is the hallmark of uh, a restriction of diet and increasing your activities yeah another question from uh, nipendra kumar deka from assam uh, whether hepatitis c is permanently curable uh, dr kosal yeah so uh, yeah. yeah so hepatitis c like i told you uh, resides in the cytoplasm and easy to cure as compared to hepatitis b and once cured uh, the patients achieve sustained virological response uh, it is equivalent to cure and sustained virological response is defined as 12 weeks after finishing therapy if the hcb rna is negative that means patient has achieved cure yeah uh, dr onil uh, another question from uh, sultana jasmine ahmed how to cure fatty liver disease how to cure fatty liver disease fatty liver disease is a combination of multiple problem starting with diabetes obesity overeating dyslipidemia it may occur also occur because of hepatitis b and hepatitis c and alcohol so all are all the are these are the reasons for development of fat in the liver first and foremost is you should tackle why it is occurring if you are overweight you reduce weight if you have been eating less restrict your calories if you drink alcohol stop drinking alcohol and there are number of drugs like steroids and carbamazepine which do put in fat in the liver so unless you tackle the basic reason for which fat develops like if you are diabetes you control your diabetes if there is insulin resistance treat accordingly if you are able to do that possibly you may be able to prevent the onerous complication which develop because of the nash and once you have nash there are new drugs which are coming up which will try to you know tackle some sort of fibrosis which is developing in these livers which will result in formation of fatty liver disease yeah the uh, jasmine has got another question uh, how to encourage children to avoid the junk food she has got a lot of questions so we can answer all these things see you have to be the role model if you are obese yourself obviously you cannot tell your children to behave properly i think it's just like you have to have gandhian ways if gandhi has taught you the simplicity of walking on foot or you know weaving the charkha you have to set the example so you have to exercise yourself you have to do not drink yourself as a parent reduce your weight control your diabetes do regular exercise i think so far as children are concerned nobody can be a better role model than the parents and the teachers absolutely see there was a study conducted in across india for childhood obesity when they took the dietetic history they said that the parents were responsible for the children's obesity i agree with that. i agree with yeah. that yeah definitely is a fact then uh, uh, professor onil another question was there uh from dr utpal jyoti deka he is a guest on the from guwahati so any relation between the covid and the raise alt and ast because he is working as a nodal officer in guwahati medical college for covid so he has got some experience about it you see if look if you look at the pathogenesis of covid 19 infection it is a single stranded rna virus which typically enters the body through the alveolar route it does not enter through the blood neither through the gi tract and the burnt of the injury is in the in the lungs and whenever the injury is more and when the patient has moderate to cv disease part of the inflammation and the hyperimmune response which the replicating virus generates primarily in the form of stimulation of th17 cells it spills over into the circulation and once it is spills over
put into circulation, you will have systemic toxicity. So the altered liver function test in a patient with COVID may be because of the hypotension, maybe because of the SARS, severe acute respiratory distress syndrome and the active inflammation. It may be because of the hypotension and the drugs which are used for treatment of uh, uh, COVID-19 infection. In fact, there is some suggestion that the biliary epithelium and cholangiocytes are supposed to have large number of the ACE2 receptors which are essential for entry of the virus into the host cells. But then by default, it typically does not damage cholangiocytes. It does not damage hepatocytes. So whatever injury is occurring in the liver manifesting as raised OTPT is an indirect manifestation of what is happening extra hepatically in the form of hypotension, drug induced injury, hypoxia, or drug related toxicity. There is no direct 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 one-to-one -one pathogenesis in the liver. Uh, another question from Amitabh Goswami Gastronomy from Bohati. He has got the question whether the fish uh, is better for fatty liver disease? See, uh, there is some suggestion that you have something called omega fatty acids. Omega fatty acids are supposed to be cardioprotective. And the biggest source of omega fatty acid, at least in the no eastern India, like northeast or or uh, Calcutta, where most of the people are fish eaters, that they could give you a good supply of omega-3. It is one of the richest sources. So if you do have fat, fat access to the fresh fish, it is generally off use because omega fatty acid gives you a lot of unsaturated fatty acid, which are supposed to be cardioprotective. There is another question from Dr. Onil Aurora from Tilak, Nagar, Delhi. How can I keep my liver healthy? I think uh, as the speaker, the questioner, is Dr. Onil or probably uh, Dr. Kosal will answer the question. How can I keep my liver healthy? Kosal? Yeah. So, uh, like uh, Dr. Anil Aurora just told you, there are four or five common causes of uh, liver diseases in our country, like hepatitis B and hepatitis C. You just heard the prevalence rate. The most common, much more common than these, is non alcoholic fatty liver disease, which uh, affects almost 20 to 30 percent of the entire population, more in the urban, less in the rural areas. And apart from this, another uh, epidemic which we are facing, uh, both in the rural and urban areas, is the uh, misuse of alcohol. So that leads to alcoholic liver disease. And the fifth are the acute hepatitis, hepatitis A and E. And if you see, all of these are preventable. Obesity, related liver disease, by uh, 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 taking up healthy lifestyle, regular exercises, uh, giving up simple sugars in your food, uh, and switching over to complex carbohydrates rather than simple carbohydrates. Alcohol, by teaching our children early in life that they have to give up alcohol and playing role models for, to them by their parents and teachers. Uh, hepatitis B, by vaccination and safe blood and sex practices. Similarly, hepatitis C by safe blood and safe sexual practices. Hepatitis B also has a vaccine available. And hepatitis A and E, which spread by food and water, can also be prevented by good hand hygiene and safe drinking, uh, provision of safe drinking and uh, water and food. So if you look at all these diseases, 95% are preventable. So if you take care of all these things, you will be saving your liver. So if you have to give one mantra, to save your liver, you have safe hands, safe syringes, safe blood, safe sex, and vaccination. Thank you. Another question was uh, already you have answered, Dr. K. K. Saxena uh, from Gongaram Hospital. Uh, how do we cure hepatitis C? Already it is answered, I think, uh, no need to address this issue. Then we have got another question about, uh, please talk about hepatitis D because we have uh, already talked about B and C. So he's, he's from Gangtok for 12. So talk about hepatitis D. Uh, so you want me to talk about it or Dr. Yeah, yeah, just Dr. just uh, in short, he is probably interested to know about mm -hmm. D. So Dr. Rao, would you want to take that or you want me yeah. to take yeah. it? Hepatitis B is a co-infection. It doesn't occur if, it, if there is no hepatitis B. Having said that, this D is very common in the Mediterranean countries. Across India, 
things we people have looked at it but we do not have a hepatitis d in india so that is the reason why in your list of testing for any hepatitis we do not ask for any hepatitis b nor the tests are available very easily also so as far as in our subcontinent is concerned i think we do not have to bother about the hepatitis d as a no interferon is one of the effective treatment for that one I hope that uh, this one. I think you practice. I think yes, yes. Yes, we can forget about yes. that. Uh, yeah, another question from Kolkata, Doctor Muhammad Javed. His question is: CKD stage five can HCV and HBV patient can be given the dialysis in the same machine? Yeah. Or two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for hepatitis B, you have to have a separate machine. many centers have now started using the same machines which they use for normal patients for hepatitis c they say that if you are uh, handling practices in the dialysis room are uh, well taken care of then no need to separate hepatitis c uh, patients on a separate machine but hepatitis b you have to have a separate machine only thing word of caution is that many people think when you are treating hepatitis c the virus will go but anti hcv persists then they equate it to persistent of the infection so people should know that anti hcv is permanently it will be positive throughout the life by treating you are reducing the hcv viral load It's a very important point made by dr goswami uh, can i comment on that dr goswami yeah yes yeah, sure sure yeah think, welcome uh, dr kaushal has very rightly said that you do not need separate for the better to see so far as you are clear that you are following practices uh, most yeah. of the hepatitis c spreads from the contamination of the vials which are used during injections during treatment and during uh, dialysate use in a country like ours i am sure we must be skipping lot of these precautions so only in the developed world there are where are systemic yeah, studies have been done like in japan and us that you recommend they do not do but most of us in india with bigger center where i am sure you cannot assure of the quality of the mixing of the syringes and use of the multiple multi dose vials that is the biggest source of contamination still most of the big centers are separating out of the machine it is worth doing yeah another question uh, from dr himantraya from uh, goa what is the dose of udilib in hepatitis so only you can answer it yeah in acute viral hepatitis you want to give anything doesn't matter because you do not need any treatment in acute hepatitis it is self limiting illness other than hepatitis c which hardly present with an acute manifestation most of the time other illnesses hepatitis a b and e are self limiting illnesses so you the dose of standard dose of uh, arso deoxycholic acid is 300 mg thrice a day yeah another question for you uh, uh from dr jigan from chennai when should we treat increase in rise of ldl cholesterol uh, you LDL see uh, yes in anything uh, now if you look at the history of uh, treatment of dyslipidemia in the cardiology circles that there is a changing definition of the lipid profile if you look, look at early 70s most important treatment indication was hypertriglyceridemia then came in hypercholesterolemia then came in low hdl and now you have a combination of high ldl and low hdl for treating dyslipidemia but of all these most important component to be treated is ldl anything more than 100 you have to be worried any ldl of more than 100 needs to be treated as is of today yeah then uh, we have got uh, another question from satish mishra from bhillai yeah yeah hbs says yeah he's got a case yeah. you know which is there that what i said hbs says he continues to be present even though the dna level has come down with the drug and alt also has come down and that is the problem that's what i said when you treat hbs cg goes only in about maximum about 10% maximum right okay yeah. and uh, our goal is
functional cure means HBSAG gone, uh, HBSAG gone, and DNA is normal, and ALT is also normal. That is a difficult to achieve. That's what we've been telling. What we've been achieving is only a partial cure. And the day, as I told you, that CCC DNA goes, that's the only way when we can say complete cure. So we have to continue the treatment till you get a HBSAG negativity, either with or without anti-HBS, but that's very difficult. That's the reason why lifelong treatment is required. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, so, so, I think it is important that we give to carry uh, Jyoti, Dr. Dr. Goswami, can I just comment on that? Yeah. Two yeah. important yes, messages yes, yes, sir. between Dr. Rao's talk and Dr. Kaushal's talk. Hepatitis B is only suppressed. It never gets cured. Patient comes to you with hepatitis B treatment with a report of HBSAG positivity. As Dr. Rao has very rightly shown you, the chance of losing this HBS antigen after five years of treatment is only 5%. So patient should not get discouraged that you're not able to treat him because he came to you for treatment of HBSAG. He did not want to have an HPV done, HPV DNA done, which we wanted to do it. So we should be very clear in the beginning that HBSAG will never go, only DNA will get suppressed. So treatment will be lifelong unless you have hepatitis C, as Dr. Kaushal has uh, told us, that three months is curative. That is the basic difference between the two because you have totally curative drug for hepatitis C on, and only suppressive drugs for hepatitis B. So whenever you want to treat hepatitis B, be very clear it is going to be lifelong therapy. If you're not committed, neither you as a doctor nor the patient as a, a receiver, I think it is better not to start the therapy. Another question uh, from Dr. Rubjoti from Dibrugarh to Anil Aurora. Uh, role of obetocolic acid in fatty liver disease? What is the common? In brief, because there are more questions we have got. In fact, uh, you know, there is some recent data. There is a multiple trials on role of this new FXR agonist called obetocolic acid, which has multitude of action, starting from its effect on the GI tract, then suppression of cholesterol synthesis, as well as uh, increased migration of the bile into the biliary system. Uh, one study from Regenerate trial recently, which is a phase three controlled study of 1800 patients has shown that in subgroup of the patient, it does it is just an interim analysis that it does decrease fibrosis, but US FDA has still not approved it. It has its own negative side effects, including uh, increased dyslipidemia and significant proritis in the recommended dose of 25 milligram. As of now, I think we should be wary of using it till we have a clearance from US FDA. Maybe you may have newer molecules with lesser side effects, effects are against, which may be the future for reduction of fibrosis in the liver. Another question uh, from Dr. Ishwar Prasad. Is hepatitis B vaccine 100% protective, Dr. Rao? Or? Yeah, in immunocompetent people, that means who has got the, the anger once, who are anybody who is immunocompetent, it is 99% protection is there. It is only in the very elderly or immunocompromised people that it is not 100%. That means- so You have to ensure that your level in the blood is more than 10 international units in immunocompetent person and more than 100 international units. Right. Most of us do not check up our level. That is the reason right. we are worried whether we'll have reinfection. So at least after the completion of the three doses, six weeks, four weeks after the last dose, if you are able to check it and the levels are high, then you have a lifelong protection. Right. Yeah, I think uh, we have got already touched upon so many questions already in almost uh, two hours. Probably we have to stop here. Uh, at the end, I must thank all the audience for joining to our program. I also thank Professor Oni Lorora, Professor P. N. Rao, and Dr. Kosal for your presentation as well as interaction it's for so long time. Thank you, and we should conclude here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye bye.